Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Ether is the perfect drug for Las Vegas. In this town, they love a drunk. Fresh meat. Come on, buddy. Come on. So they put us through the turnstiles and turned us loose inside. Hello and welcome to another episode of Dose of Ether. Thanks for joining us again. And my co-host today is Evan Van Ness. What's up, Evan? Howdy, what's going on? Chilling. Another sunny day in California. It's a sunny day in Texas. <laughs> it usually is. <laughs> I love watching weather in California because it's the exact same every single day. It's like today's sunny. Guess what? So's tomorrow. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's probably a little too dry here for like the sustainability of this large of a population. But besides from that, it's always nice to go to the beach. <laughs> you're, you're clearly in SoCal because NorCal, not so sunny. I've I'm been, in I've very SoCal. In SF. <laughs> yeah, I'm just outside of San Diego right now. So uh, I don't know. Maybe you know this, but. Uh, like I spent a bunch of time in SF this summer. D- D- I did not realize that it is cold the entire year round. Like people talk about having moderate temperature all year round, but I think I had gone in warmer times of the month. So of course I looked up like the average temperature by month. Do you know what the warmest temp- the warmest month is in, in SF? I would say it's December. It's September. September. <laughs> yeah. And it, if I recall correctly, because it's been a couple months since I looked this up now, it was 71 degrees. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, I don't know. No shorts in SF. There's never a reason, even if it's July. I found that out the hard way. Yeah, I heard a joke from someone who grew up in SF, and it's like, the coldest winter is summer in San Francisco. And the worst part is that it always catches tourists by surprise. So whenever you see someone in shorts, you're just like freezing their ass off. Yeah, it's that. I mean, that was yeah. That's me. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, I mean, it's a nice, still nice to be in California, but it's just the water is freezing. <laughs> it's like a consistent um, a current coming from like Alaska constantly. I don't think you could go in the water in San Francisco without a wetsuit. And doesn't get much yeah. better by San Diego. It's still cold. You, it's reasonable, but right. it's tough. <laughs> when I was a consultant, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago now, I had never been in the Pacific Ocean. So I like, parked my rental car alongside the PCH in Malibu and like ran across the, the PCH, the Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, and I own... Um, I wasn't wearing a suit. I don't know what I was wearing. Because, in fact, that, that client... I wore like a tie the first day and the client told me I wasn't allowed to come back if I wore a tie. Uh, anyway. Um, and I was, I thought they were joking. And so I laughed and then they're like, no, no, seriously, don't come back tomorrow if you're wearing uh, like a tie or a jacket. I was like, okay, not, not going to do that again. Anyway. So I like go like running into the, to the Pacific ocean, like, like throwing my clothes off on the beach, like behind me. Um, and then like, I get into like, you know, my thighs and I like start screaming like a little girl. It was so cold. <laughs> I'm I was just laughing at the I- I'm laughing at the idea of people being super serious about how laid back they are in California. <laughs> oh yeah, that's that that's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like forced informality. <laughs> yeah, the, I asked I was like, "So what am I allowed to wear?" They were like, "You can wear a polo shirt." And I was like, "Okay. That's fine. Yeah. I'll go buy one." <laughs> so the first thing that uh, we need to mention, basically because it's the last day, Gitcoin is currently having a grants program with a large matching donation and contribution. Um, and the Ethereum Foundation and Consensus have both allocated a bunch of money uh, towards this as well. Um, but you know more about this. Do you want to tell us a bit about it? Yeah, sure. So um, Vitalik... Uh, and some other people have come up with this um, variations on a theme, but it's basically like um, it goes by various names, but the one that they seem to use on this Gitcoin grants program is CLR, which is like 
well, I don't know, continuous liberal radicalism or something. I don't know. It's just a term name anyway. Um, but basically the idea is your grants, it's a matching, it's matching funds, um, but that it is matched like by equation. So basically quadratically. So you basically, if you donate a dollar or one die, uh, then you get a huge ton of matching and um, especially early on in in the thing, like a week ago, when not a lot of people had done it because everybody waits till the end, like one dollar would give you like a matching grant of like two hundred dollars on some projects, and even now, a one dollar donation to some of these projects will give you fifty dollars. I think there are even some that are probably at a hundred dollars. So, um, it's a pretty interesting idea. I, uh, you know, the the thing is that it depends on on identity because it can be civil attacked obviously right like i could create a bunch of fake accounts and give a dollar and then give all get all the money for myself the way that gitcoin deals with that is by having get you have to log in with your github account and so then they can you know monitor suspicious activity and you know, they can check and see whether you have commits. Um, so if a bunch of people give money, give a dollar at the last minute to one project and none of these projects have commits, they're probably going to wipe out all of those matching funds. So um, yeah, that's basically the idea. I mean, it's, um, it's something Vitalik in particular thinks is pretty cool since it was his idea. Um, I, I have to be honest, I'm a little bit like, um, their Sybil, their their Sybil resistance, like by using GitHub, is interesting, but it does make me a little queasy because they haven't published clear guidelines for what they consider to be Sybil resistance or to acceptable behavior. Like, if I tell ten people to go give me uh, a dollar, right? Like, I'm a I'm a potential grantee. If I tell ten of my friends uh, to go give me a dollar, and they aren't GitHub users and they go sign up for GitHub and I even give each of them a dollar, but they're real people. Is that, is that against the rules or not? Like it's very unclear now and you're basically depending on Gitcoin's unpublished so far, not transparent um, formula, but it's an interesting experiment. So I do the suggest that everybody money, does it. Yeah. The amounts of money aren't like massive. Um, the current round has a hundred thousand dollars for matching currently, um, but it's growing it's, and they have more money allocated. It's two hundred thousand. It's a hundred thousand from the foundation, the Ethereum Foundation, and a hundred thousand from Consensus. Okay, and um, they are supporting, as they say, eighty well-known open-source initiatives. For example, they're supporting the Burner Wallet um, developed by Austin Griffith. And the grants would essentially help him like fund and continue working on similar projects as that. Exactly. And, um, yeah, I agree. It, but if there's a pre-selection essentially for the types of initiatives that can get funded, then I think it is a good way to incentivize, incentivize people to uh, donate to open source projects. That's the dream of Gitcoin, right? And of software development in general, I wish there was like a functioning standardized model for funding open source software initiatives. Um, but the current way that certain things like the Linux Foundation are funded are they just feel inherently unsustainable because it required them to essentially become like massive institutional partners before they even had sustainable cash flow from something like Red Hat in the case of Linux, right? And in the case of like small little Ethereum projects that are trying to build um, public good type projects like open source wallets or something like that, then finding a self-sustaining business model has been quite tough. Even core client development is fundamentally like an unsustainable financial proposition as has been made um, publicly, as has been made publicly clear essentially by parity and the fact that they're 
support of the Ethereum One client that they're very famous for um, is kind of like a loss leader for them, besides the fact that it earns them the reputation and the credibility that it has um, now. It's one of those things in which like the Ethereum Foundation isn't funding parity for maintaining the parity client, right? They're funding... I disagree with that. I, I heard that argument on Twitter, but I think that's incorrect. Uh, like, the, Do you think it's sustainable to work on... Uh, I mean, the $5 like million the dollars obviously included their work on the on the ETH1 client. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not as familiar with it, but um, are they continuing to support the ETH1 client? They are. I mean, the they are just not with the same on, level. On that. Okay. I mean, they are following their incentives, which is that you know, the, like parity is going is heavily incentivized towards Polkadot, right? And most people at Parity work on Polkadot. They are the contractors for Polkadot. They you know have a bunch of dots. Um, it shouldn't be surprising that that is their primary focus. Okay. And in your opinion, is this essentially a conflict of interest in the fact that they are being funded to work on the future of ETH2 while also developing their own alternative to ETH2? That's kind of like the difficult question, you know? Um, Is it a conflict of interest? Um, I mean... I, like I, I, that's that's not the way I would look at it. Um, I would say they have gotten paid by the Ethereum Foundation to do certain work on Ethereum. Um, they also, I mean, as you say, like it is the source of their reputation so far. So I think they are also somewhat, at least somewhat, incentivized to keep the ETH one client up. They're also probably incentivized to do an ETH2 client because Polkadot needs, P- Polkadot claims to be interoperability, right? And so mm-hmm. if you don't have an intero, uh, if you're not interoperable with Ethereum and ETH2, then what are you interoperable with? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, all right. the devs, all the users, all, you know, all the developers are on ETH. So, I would, I mean, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say it's a conflict of interest. I think it's, uh, I would say the interests are at least somewhat aligned. And not to mention, it's undeniable. some things are more than others. Right. It's also undeniable that the work that they've done in Polkadot has somewhat, if not directly, uh, translated in ETH2 work. The best example probably being the uh, Wasm VM. And it seems like some the lessons that they learned essentially gets fed back into the development process and iteration process of improving Ethereum 2 as well. So I, I tend to disagree then from the radical like Ethereum maximalist, I can't believe there's such a thing, but there is a view in the sense that if you develop more open source software that improves the usability and functioning of blockchain, some of it is going to be integrated in the Ethereum clients of the future, right? It's it's uh, basically a survival of the best implementations, and doing something completely different that's very challenging is only going to help in the end, right? And I don't think it's really worth fighting these small battles over, like, marketing when the technology is not even done on either side. But, Yeah. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how much of like Polkadot's work on Wasm has fed back into Ethereum. Like, not to nitpick with that specific example, but I know that Near like tore out uh, Polkadot's Wasm engine because they could use somebody else's. I forget who it was. I think it was Wazi um, or Wasmer maybe, uh, and they had like a hundred x speed up. Um, but I mean, yeah, it is definitely true that all of these things are using each other's libraries and ideas and remixing it and making different trade-offs. I, I think that's like uh, totally fair. And certain people, certain ETH2 clients, for example, use different 
libraries and whatnot from different groups, right? Like, because not everybody mm -hmm. uses the exact same libraries because different languages and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes. We sense went. We well. went straight for the hot button issue on the, on this on this episode. I didn't even. I mean, we weren't even going to cover this, were we? No, not at all. It's one of those things in which everyone knows it's going on, but at the same time, it's like the the adopted stepchild of sorts of issues <laughs> that it seems like everyone either has a very strong like opinion on, or I mean, it seems like both of our opinions are more middling and it prefers neither really it's like it'd be nice if there were people who spent like a little bit more concentrated focus on the current and future uh, client implementations but another part of me is just thankful that there's like completely independent innovation that's happening from like an external organization that's been around with ethereum since the very start and like they just had a different vision on how to scale it. And I'm glad they pursue it because maybe it works, right? Maybe it becomes a fundamental part of like the next generation blockchain clients. And that would only be a good thing for me. Um, yeah, maximalism aside, I think it's open source software. The more like the more experiments are going on, the better. And Parity is building an ETH2 client, right? There's seven other ETH2 clients. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's not like they're basically leaving the ecosystem. It's not like they can. <laughs> there's, there's no other ecosystem in town. <laughs> yeah, it's tough to get too upset about people for following their incentives, right? I mean, absolutely. Um, yeah. They could go off and raise $100 million because people were willing to give them that money and because there was a lot of money being thrown at really bad base chains. Um, and I'm happier frankly, that they even, got some of yeah. that versus um, the next topic of discussion, someone who raised uh, a team who raised about $7 billion. Um, specifically Depends on how you're counting, one. right? <laughs> yeah, well... That's a few billion uh, here or there. <laughs> Um, I mean, wasn't seven billion the amount that was in the recent SEC statement, or did they put it at four billion? I don't know. I I actually I, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I thought they put it at four, but I yeah, I don't really know. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to count that. Uh, that's all I was saying. I mean, the real number that we're focusing on is uh, 24 million actually, which was the fine yeah, that the exactly. SEC imposed on uh, Block One, which is the company or foundation, however they're structured, that um, is currently building EOS.io. And um, it seems like a very small penalty compared to the amount of money that they've raised. And from everything that I've read, all I can say is props to their legal team. Like, that's kind of impressive. You know, unfortunately, the way government works is when you're too big to fail, you are too big to fail and you get special treatment. I like, I think, I mean, I think like the reason I say that is that Saya also announced a settlement today and it didn't get as much coverage, but Saya sold $120,000, right? So 0.12 million, 0.12 million. So, I mean, literally like a thousand times less money than EOS. They had to pay back 225,000. So basically double what they raised, they had to pay back in penalties. Meanwhile, EOS raises 5 billion and has to pay like 0.001% of what they raise. Uh, I, you know, I don't even really know what to say aside from like the injustice of that is, is incredible. I mean, Saya, I'm not like, I mean, Saya is at least a legit te technological project that is like doing real tech work and did a non overly marketed sale 
like in more of the beginning times of the space, um, raised a small amount of money, didn't do it with shady tactics. EOS raises billions and gets a slap on the wrist. I, I mean, like the injustice is, I don't know, kind of appalling to me, to be honest with you. An addition benefit but, to the current settlement that EOS got is that they essentially are going to be protected from future prosecutions by investors because their settlement actually um, allows them to say that they didn't cause their investors damages, which is huge because it means all of the money that they have accumulated through this ICO, you know, the money that they tried to like buy a town in Puerto Rico with, um, it's now because of this $24 million settlement, um, it actually indemnifies them of wrongdoing to their investors. Are you sure? I mean, I think they settled with the SEC, but I thought that the SEC actually put something that basically invited private civil suits. Um, we're going to post, we're going to post some like preliminary legal, uh, reviews of these documents. Um, but I'm specifically referring to Catherine Wu's annotated settlement letter, which I will share to you as well. <laughs> and on on page four of that document, it says this is actually a huge win for EOS. Basically, the SEC said that there was no fraud or criminal conviction in the sale, which means that it is now up to the individual investor to prove that there was wrongdoing. So think about that. If the government wasn't able to um, implicate them in any wrongdoing, that means it is completely the onus of the individuals or the investors that were wronged to prove that there were damages because of misconduct. So basically- Well, I haven't, I haven't read the full thing yet, but I mean, just because they couldn't try to press a criminal case, which it sounds like it's what they're talking about there. Mm-hmm. I mean, people, it, it's an unregistered, they, they basically cop to being an unregistered unreg- security. So people yes. can sue for damages in a private civil suit. And there are people that bought in dollar terms, like significantly higher than right now, right? So those people, I'm pretty sure the door is wide open for those people to sue. Yes, but um, in addition to proving that they bought an unregistered security, they also have to prove, well, first of all, they mentioned in the suit that they tried to um, restrict U.S individuals from buying the token. Um, Although it did show that they didn't try hard enough because geo-blocking is insufficient. Um, And then they spent a bunch of like paperwork and legal uh, definitions within the filings to explain that now like they're a more mature company and they're trying to comply. And I mean, to make it even more ironic, they recently set up headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia, and they received a $600,000 grant from the government. Yeah, well, all I can say is I guess this is why I'm a libertarian. (laughs) Our tax dollars at work, ladies and gentlemen. Right. (laughs) A $600,000 grant to give to to someone who has billions of dollars. You got to love it. Yeah, absolutely love it. And it seems like they gave up on Puerto Rico uh, when people there had a problem with a tech company literally buying up entire towns worth of property at depressed uh, post-tropical storm prices. Um, But there's there's another case, um, which is Kik. So Kik recently got wrecked (laughs) right like and the interesting the interesting thing is that kick they already had a product they had millions of users on a social app 
And their ICO was essentially to create an internal token mechanism that allowed people to like buy and trade stickers on the app and um, other aspects, essentially. It was like a way to stimulate a digital economy within their um, online social networking platform. Um, are you familiar with this case as well? Yeah, I, you know, the SEC wants people to settle with it. They tried to settle with Kick. Kick refused to settle with them. Um, frankly, I think this is like a little bit of egos at play on both sides. Like, the SEC was was pretty annoyed that Kick decided to do what it did after the Canadian version of the SEC had told them that they thought it was a security. And so Kick said, well, okay, well, we'll exclude Canada and we'll go to America. So the SEC was like predisposed a, a bit against them in, in the first place. Um, and then they, you know, they tried to settle and Kick decided uh, not to settle and instead they're going to fight it and they're spending lots of money. Um, I think like the it, the weird thing about this case is a lot of people in, in our space would like to defend Kick, like both because they don't really seem like they're bad actors, um, but uh, also because like the precedent may get set in a bad way for like everybody in our space. The, the problem is Kick seems to make it kind of hard to be on their side. I mean, they raised kind of crazy amounts of money. They kind of made it easy for people to dump on retail. Um, they then like immediately left Ethereum. They then like left that for something else. Now they're running like a private version of a permission chain like Stellar. So, I mean, at that point, like, what are you really doing? Are you, you're, it's like barely a blockchain, right? Um, mm. and, uh, you know, this week it came out that they're going to shut down kick. <laughs> so like, you know, the whole selling point of their thing was that they had this messenger with millions of users and they were going to put a currency in their app and it was going to work and make it possible for them to compete with Facebook. And now they're not, they're getting rid of their app, which is still like, top 50 or top 100 app um so yeah so it's, it's, the reason it's that they're actually shutting down their site is because they have to scale down their operations to drop their burn rate by 85 percent so that they could be put in a position to get through the sec trial with the resources that they have so essentially yeah fighting the government is super expensive i mean it's it takes yeah it takes Many millions. I mean, that is the problem, which is, you know, why most people settle. Yeah, they tried to create some outrage over this specific indictment. If I'm not mistaken, they even tried crowdsourcing uh, their legal defense at one point. They did, it didn't yeah. work that well. Um, there were a number of points that they also miss, and the SEC essentially found... Um, specific official statements made by the company which uh, guaranteed or, or made a promise of a return. And this might sound like a technicality, but someone selling a, quote, utility token, which they publicly stated in some random blog or newsletter, but it doesn't matter because it was public and the SEC got their hands on it, they mention the possibility of appreciation and the fact that people should actually be able to uh, get more money out of it. I think the real worrying precedent about Kick isn't actually the ICO, in my opinion. It was a venture capital funded company which turned to an ICO and everyone suspects that it's so that the venture capitalists themselves could have a liquidity event in order to basically bail themselves out of a company that they realized would never be profitable. And I think that's the dangerous precedent, right? Like we don't want crypto to be the graveyard of failed tech companies. Well, I mean, 
flip side of that is like often the people that are you know going to adopt a new technology are the ones that are you know have the most incentive to do so right um i i uh I, I guess what I, what I actually did disagree with there is that you said that there were like I could promise people profit. Um, I mean, I read the SEC's 60 page complaint and I read Kick's response. Um, I, I don't, you know, Kick would say and makes a pretty compelling case that they never actually promised people profit and or appreciation and that like SEC took those out of context. And actually like in some of those cases, I would argue like, like they're definitely right. Like the SEC lawyers were really reaching, like like basically took the, completely misused the context to like turn it around to like, where he actually wasn't promising profit and made it sound like he was. Um, I actually read I, the, the supposed yeah. promises and I 100% agree with you. And it's just that the SEC used that to latch on. And it just made their specific like indictment and their case that much more difficult. And it would also make it a really bad case to set a precedent as well, right? Because that one fact alone actually changes how um, it basically changes the entire thing. Because essentially they're arguing that it is a security rather than arguing that it would have a utility on the network of the organization, right? Because both cases can obviously be made and they're going through with it and they're trying to fight it and they're trying to actually make these arguments. Um, yeah. But it just shows, and this is just like the most extreme example of how the subjective nature of the U.S. regulatory system, which might I add, doesn't have clear guidelines or precedent established yeah. for how to properly run any of this, right? And then the difference of one company that has raised a lot of money and has spent a substantial of amount of it on very good lawyers, apparently, that doesn't have, like, they didn't, they were pre-product, right? Do you remember when we were talking about the Howie test and we're like, if you have a product when you launch, therefore, and your token is directly used within your product, then it's utility, right? That has like completely gone out the window. And that was like wishful thinking of us having like simple, straightforward regulation. But as we've seen, it seems like the government wants to make kings. And if they do get more and more heavy handed with things that are just not blatant crimes, right? Um, then they could be put into the position in which they pick winners. And unfortunately for them, I don't think they realize that in the end, this will be permissionless technology and the best technology is going to win regardless of what they say, right? If we look at historic antitrust lawsuits, um, for example, Microsoft being uh, sued over Internet Explorer, by the time the US government finished that lawsuit, Internet Explorer was no longer even in the top three internet browsers. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. And I mean, it's this technology is moving just as fast. And um, I mean, we'll see. <laughs> it's. I mean, the, the amusing thing there is you said it's this permissionless technology. And like the two things we're talking about are basically not permissionless, which is EOS and Stellar, or well, Kin is a fork of Stellar, so it's, it, but they're like close enough to our space that they're going to affect us, right? Um, mm -hmm. Which is uh, the unfortunate. And it's I also guess, about governance too, right? Like the legal governance of how some of these organizations were made. For example, the governance of Kin was heavily influenced by the uh, previous investors into the company, and in EOS, I mean. I don't really get how their governance works, but um, it's obviously done in such a way that it, you could essentially organize a oligarchy and collude the entire network into doing whatever you want. Um, and that's before you even take into account block one itself, which I think is structured as, um, as a foundation, but I mean, it's just a centralized organization that manages a multi-billion dollar war chest. Um, 
and I've yet to hear anything about yeah. that. Yeah. I, I, I guess tangential here, but before we move on, the the one thing we could say, which we've sort of danced around, is that you know part of the reason, the big reason why Kick didn't. Well, I guess they probably want to be called Kin now, but the reason why Kick didn't settle with the SEC is because the SEC was going to insist that Kin be traded as a security. And now EOS, part of their settlement was that EOS would not be a security. So you sort of would hope that like the SEC and Kin like figure out a settlement. I mean, it it really doesn't look fair like what they've done so far and like i said like kick doesn't make it easy to defend themselves but i mean i, I don't know they they didn't they didn't pump up they didn't like their marketing tactics weren't even as aggressive as eos's let's put it that way yeah all right let's talk neither... about actual tech again <laughs> <laughs> right it's like we're not lawyers if you couldn't tell <laughs> and neither could we probably I don't think a single lawyer right now could probably accurately tell you how to conduct an ICO successfully. It's, yeah, it seems like an unsolved problem still. Um, but yes. I mean, lawyers are like the two arm economist, right? You know, it's like, like the, uh, you know, like, I think it was Ronald Reagan used to, used to make the joke that he was looking for a one armed economist because every economist would say like well this is the way it is but on the other hand right, um, oh, right. And like lawyers are the same way like they will prevaricate in any situation because the law is unclear and you are always going to be at subject to the whims of whatever court mood people deciding that case right so mm -hmm. um, people people that act like law is deterministic or you know just wrong as nick zabo would say wet code not deterministic Mm -hmm. yeah it's um yeah i'm uh i don't think a one-armed economist or a one-armed lawyer exists right now but i mean <laughs> damn i i hate the fact that like my technology like perspectives and how i think someone designs technology influences how i view the legality or like its relationship to how moral or correctly they did something they're not the same thing right like if you have very good lawyers then you could get away with things that might or might not be crimes <laughs> and that has happened all too often but if you have crappy technology you're gonna die eventually right like it's just survival of the fittest and there's not enough like investor money for you to basically bail out a bag tech project um not like it people don't try <laughs> on the on the other hand like the the job of the sec like the mission is to protect investors right so right like especially when it is a gray area like it is right now like sec's job is to protect investors which means like yep. the people that are actually doing real tech work should probably get more of the benefit of the doubt than eos but hey whatever i agree anyway, and let's move on <laughs> it's difficult for them so um yeah it, to wrap it up basically the sec ran out of obvious ponzi schemes like bitconnect and now they're moving into the gray area of um maybe it's a security maybe it's not which we'll see <laughs> Which we'll see, and hopefully I don't even think that's true. I think there's still way more fraud that like the SEC has left to go after, like outright fraud. I do. I, I know. Yeah. I do too. I'm I'm sure they haven't even like close to filled this yeah. up. I think they're just trying to like whack the whack a mole with uh, easy wins, um, and apparently totally. EOS was an easy win, except they settled very cheap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So another. Anyway. Um, Another organization that raised a bunch of money in 2017. Just kidding. I can't. If I introduce every company like that, then. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, Filecoin. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. Filecoin, the makers of IPFS, um, and they're actually making progress on the actual Filecoin as opposed to just IPFS. It seems like IPFS has been around for a very long time, but Filecoin hasn't actually been progressing um, in the past two years. They've been working behind the scenes. They didn't even have their code repository uh, open regarding um, Filecoin until very recently. But there's some very exciting new developments as well. And yeah, do you want to talk about it a little bit first? I mean, you're probably the better person to talk about this than I am. I, you know, supposedly I think they said testnet due in like the next month or two, like maybe December. And then they, they said September 25th. Yeah. yeah, a mainnet soon to follow like in Q1 after, which I... Um, I have a lot of skepticism about whether they actually pull that off, which is, you know, fine. I mean, you know, two weeks is, you know, always two weeks and the last 10% of doing anything, you know, takes way more than 10% of the time, but uh, it would be great. I mean, we need a data letter, data layer, whether it is Swarm or Filecoin or, or whatever, you know, Ethereum and IPFS or Filecoin have a long history. In fact, at DEF CON too. People even, you occasionally see people wearing these shirts. IPFS made these better together shirts for mm -hmm. Filecoin and, and, and Ethereum. So um, like with the two logos intertwined and they announced at DevCon too that, that Filecoin was going to be built on Ethereum. And then then they realized they could raise a hundred million dollars in the, in the year after that and decided to do that instead. Um, but, you know, hey, uh, if we get permissionless websites, right, that are, you know, can't be shut down and, you know, aren't subject to the whims of, you know, centralized DNS that can get hijacked and whatnot, better for everybody. We do need yeah. those for Web3. Yep. And not to mention, they like ship tech that has been in use. Um, I've used IPFS uh, nodes as well. But because they didn't have the proper incentivization structure, I would have to self-host IPFS nodes, which I think is kind of funny, right? So I would get like right. AWS cloud resources, and then I would host an IPFS node myself, and then I would store my files on my own cloud instance, which was more expensive and more inefficient than just using AWS straight up as S3. But they have a really cool addressing system with lib p2p and the fact that like the url and the hash of the um of the content are actually the same thing is just it's still really cool and it's very useful for ethereum um it's like an extra it's got an extra security kick to it and yeah as you said ethereum needs a data layer right and uh ipfs is uh, pretty good for that as well. Um, but there's been one thing that's been holding them back for a while, and it is specifically their consensus mechanism. So they have a really weird system in which you have to prove that you have a specific amount of space on an unused hard drive available over a certain period of time. Right, And they wanted to do a type of proof of work that proves that you have space available across a sp um, an amount of time. right? So they called it proof of space time, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, and proof of space time, besides sounding hilariously impossible to actually develop, um, is now actually ready, um, which is surprising. And they have a new consensus mechanism called uh, expected consensus. Um, I don't know a lot about this yet, since they've only just released the spec. Um, but they also have like a bunch of innovations that they're introducing into this new implementation that um, includes zero knowledge proofs, and um, it's going to be really interesting. There's progress, and they, they're they going to at least put out some new code soon. The Alphanet is out September 25th, which has already passed, and the first public Filecoin testnet will be 
out December 11th, 2019, which is wow. cool. Yeah. And I, so have I'm they excited. released the code or just the they spec? They did. Yep, they did. Okay. They uh, released a Go implementation. They're also going to make a Rust implementation. Um, and actually, I think their implementation uses both Go and Rust in the same library, but for different things just by looking at it. But now they've actually made this public. Uh, previously, their work on this consensus mechanism wasn't uh, being shared. And when you would look at the file coined, um, it like they basically had kind of like an empty repo that they used for the ICO <laughs> for quite a long yeah. time. But yeah. now they're filling it in. How do you feel about stints. that? I mean, I I think it's like an interesting philosophical question, which you know, Definity also kept it closed and still is closed um, as to whether like you know you should build in the open or not, which seems pretty against the ethos of the space. I'm very yes. curious to see whether it kind of bites them in the butt because, like, I mean, there's so much novel in there. Like, even like zero knowledge is almost. I mean, we're still in the frontiers of that, and that's even like probably one of the more understood problems I feel like of the things that they're unveiling. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Uh, I'm curious if you have any reaction there or what? Um, I know why they did it. I mean, maybe even Definity, I know why they did it. First of all, because they had no idea how to do it. It was something <laughs> well, that was yeah. theorized a long time ago, but it was never successfully done. Nobody and, knew how to do a theorem either, and you know they managed to pull it off in 2014. But here's another thing. Do you know Tron? Building in the open. But... Do you know Tron? Yeah. Okay, they copied and pasted Filecoin's white paper for their own ICO. Right. Right. And then so they copied and they... pasted Ethereum J. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the actual their code. code. <laughs> which is funny. Yeah. <laughs> And they added in the uh, the credits later, <laughs> right? Yeah, so. Um, so I kind of understand why they would be reticent to do it. I personally am strongly in favor of building out in the open, but it's not always a possibility. And sometimes when you're flailing to find a solution to a hard theoretical problem, um, you don't really want to make it known how difficult or how far you are from your specific goal. Um, and it's not like they haven't contributed to Ethereum research either, right? Yeah, they've done some work on lib, or they've done, they've driven the work on lib P2P. That's like protocol labs has. That That is definitely yeah. fair to say. And they've even um, split it off and uh, as a different open source project, right? Yeah, so they, and, and been... I think they even have somebody that is on staff of Protocol Labs whose job, or at least a big part of his job, is to make sure that ETH2 is happy with it. Because the you know, interoperability for them also with Ethereum is pretty important. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think Filecoin is definitely one of the good actors in this space. Um, their Agreed. innovations have, kind of speak for themselves. They've been able to recruit people that had the expertise in zero knowledge proofs to actually pull this off. Um, and right. I mean, I'm just surprised it's happening this soon. <laughs> actually, I'm that surprised means the it's SEC happening. That will probably go after them. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I hope not. I mean, literally, they, you know, what they're doing technologically is, you know, a thousand X, a 10,000 X, what EOS or um, Kick have done. So, um, yeah. I guess yeah. we're we're bumping up on time. You want to talk about Connect? I think that's a pretty cool thing that happened. They shipped V2 to mainnet this week. Yep, and Connect is a um, layer two scaling solution that has implemented generalized state channels. Um, however, what I'm really interested in is who's going to use it, because their blog post starts with an overly ambitious claim of how are we going to get a billion people to start using Ethereum? Cool, but I haven't seen anyone use Connext yet. Um, I don't know. I think they integrated the burner wallet. Um, I'm definitely interested in it, and this is a project that I personally am looking forward to using in a project. Um, 
they launched v1 of the die card which is pretty cool as well and it makes uh, it simplifies the UI and the interaction between uh, making state channel transitions. Um, but I I really want to see people using generalized state channels, and I think the Connect implementation is maturing, and hopefully people start using it. But my main interest is when are people actually going to start using it? Yeah, they, you know, they have some projects that are building on top of what they've done. And of course, they're building on top of Counterfactual and Magmo's unified spec, which is sort of like state channels, but maybe a, a layer lower in the, uh, in the state channel spec or in stack, excuse me. Um, you, you, you know, I gave away $20 in, in increments of like 10 or 20 cents, like a couple months ago on die card. Um, it was, you know, it's a pretty good experience. It definitely worked. Um, you know, the UX was not like super polished, of course. Um, I'm excited for them to get V2 out there. Um, the, the thing I would say is that MetaMask Mobile, which is a pretty, pretty useful wallet, has uh you can it, it's kind of hidden in the settings but you can use connects on on there and it's it's pretty cool uh, but yeah it's definitely a little bit more of a you know a, a release for developers than it is for users at this point mm -hmm. yep and i mean i don't know if this is going to be the like instigator of mass adoption but this is what surprises me. I think it definitely can be, <laughs> right? Like if you can abstract away the fact and people don't even need to know that they're using Ethereum unless they're like hardcore developers and they're super interested in that kind of stuff. Um, eventually, I think uh, layer two solutions with gas costs abstracted away and with good functional interfaces could potentially be the way that everyone is onboarded onto Ethereum applications. And I need to be proven right about this because <laughs> I also said this about two years ago. <laughs> yeah, the future is layer two. You know, it's, uh, it's taking a little bit longer than we, when we thought maybe. I think there's, you know, it's not super easy to use layer one and then you have to make some more abstractions out to use layer two. So it's for developers to build on it, but I, you know, I think we're 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 getting there. I mean, it's uh, you know, it's just taking a little bit of time, but definitely the long term, like even with ETH two and its massive scalability, even then, I think we'll see a lot of stuff happen on on layer two, especially because it just you know you get instant finality, you get um, privacy and whatnot. So yeah, I think we're up on time. We are, and I will see you in Japan. Hope to see right. people at DevCon in Osaka. Um, maybe we'll even record a show in person there. Sounds good. Come up, come up and say hi. Take a picture with us for Ethermon. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Absolutely. See you later. Bye. Bye.